Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Lucha, how long will I have to wait for you? The dough is ready. She went to the river again with her Sergio, I bet. Lucha, are you here? Valentina Iglesias put her hand to her forehead, hiding her eyes from the sun, and looked for her daughter on the yard, her other hand covered in flour. Valentina, not waiting for an answer, cursed and went to the house, muttering as she went. She's so restless. I told her that I'd need help, and she went out again. I swear, my patience will run out someday, and then you'll see what kind of a good mother I am. As if by the wave of a magic wand, Lucha's voice was heard nearby. Mom, I'm coming. Just one more minute. Valentina shook her head and disappeared into the house. Lucha was in the yard of the house across the street, hiding behind the leaves of the trees. When she saw that her mother had gone inside, she turned to the guy standing in front of her. Hey, do I have any grass in my hair? Lucha demanded, shaking her thick dark hair in front of the guy. The guy looked at the girl with admiration and then said quietly, No one has such beautiful hair as you. Lucha waved her hand irritably. Oh, Sergio, stop it. Okay, I gotta go, mom is waiting. Wait, Lucha, I want to hug you. Lucha coyly replied. Okay, hug me, but quickly, I need to run. Sergio embraced Lucha and pressed his lips to hers. In response, the girl hugged his neck, but after a couple of seconds, she began to push him away. Sergio, I'm serious. My mother won't let me go out anymore. It'll be your fault that I'll be punished. Let me go, silly. I'll never let you go. Do you hear me? No matter what happens, I'll always keep you in my arms, Sergio replied seriously and finally let her go. Lucha grinned and ran back to the house. Sergio watched her go with loving eyes. As far as he could remember, he had been head over heels in love with her. This feeling had filled him completely. He couldn't think of anyone else except his beloved Lucha. Sometimes his friends teased him, but he didn't pay attention to them. Lucha was a very beautiful girl, and many guys in the village stared at her, but no one showed clear signs of interest because they were all afraid of Sergio. A couple of times, he had already gotten into fights with the locals, making it clear to everyone that Lucha wouldn't be given to anyone else. Lucha wasn't against that. She didn't like any of the local guys, and she was fine with Sergio serving as her protection against persistent admirers. Once couldn't say she was crazy about Sergio, not yet. She liked him, but not to the point of being head over heels. But he was more attractive to her than other guys. Sergio was fine with that for now. He wanted more, but he hadn't talked to Lucha about it yet, or rather, he had hinted at it, but Lucha turned everything into a joke, not giving him a direct refusal. When Lucha disappeared into the house, Sergio sighed and ruffled his hair with his hand. He walked towards the house, smiling and thinking about his relationship with Lucha. When Lucha rushed into the house, her mother began to complain. Lucha, did you decide to test my patience? How much longer can this go on? You disappear somewhere all day long, and who will help your mother? Do I have any assistance? I don't know where you hang out, but I'm tired of it. Lucha jumped to her mother, kissed her on the cheek, and cooed. Mom, don't be mad. I'll always help you, don't make things up. I said I'd help with the pastries. I just got delayed a bit, I had some things to take care of. Valentina grumbled. I know your things. Running to your admirer again, I bet it was Sergio again. Lucha narrowed her eyes and bit her lip. I didn't run anywhere. What do you mean, run to someone? He's the one running after me. Valentina looked closely at her daughter. Lucha, he's a good guy, you know. I hope you're not playing with his head. He loves you, it's clear. How do you feel about him? Lucha washed her hands with soap, silently put on an apron, and started working with the dough. After a few minutes, she said thoughtfully, I don't know, Mom, it seems to me that it's too early to think about it. You're already 18. Do you think it's too early to think about it? 
Lucha brushed her bangs from her forehead and looked her mother in the eyes. I don't know, Mom. I think that if I promise Sergio something now, I might miss out on something very important later. Valentina shook her head reproachfully. She couldn't understand today's youth. Where do they get such thoughts? It used to be different in her time. If they liked each other, they would be together. If they loved each other, they would get married, have children, face difficulties together, and grow old together. And now what? Everyone seems to be afraid of missing something. What opportunities could there be? She found a good guy. She should grab onto him with both hands, and that's it. I don't know, Lucha, you're scaring me a bit. You're nothing like me, you think differently, you have different thoughts, and you don't take things seriously. Don't be frivolous, you need to think about the future. I am thinking about the future, Mom. I'm only thinking about it, Lucha replied thoughtfully. Of course, she didn't want to miss out on something. She felt that if she got married too early, she might regret it later. She liked Sergio, but what if she hadn't met her true love yet? What if she didn't love Sergio enough? On the other hand, he was better than anyone in their village. She couldn't deny that. And he was ready to worship the ground she walked on. He would fight anyone for her. He would do anything she asked. He would treat her like a queen. Wasn't that wonderful? Yes, means quite a lot. With Sergio, Lucha could be sure he wouldn't abandon her even in the toughest of situations. This was essential for her. She didn't want her life to turn out like her mother's. Her father had left them when Lucha was three years old, all because of an unfortunate accident her mother had. Her mother had accidentally impaled herself on a pitchfork while in a haystack, severely injuring her leg. She spent several months in bed while her deep wounds healed. Meanwhile, her father had gone off to party and eventually left them, heading in an unknown direction with a new lover. They never saw him again. Lucha was convinced that Sergio would never do such a thing. But what slightly pushed her away from Sergio was that he was a country boy and Lucha had long dreamed of moving to the city. When she talked to Sergio and asked him about his dreams, all his aspirations revolved around one thing, living in the countryside. Lucha really wanted to become a city dweller and she felt that Sergio wouldn't support her in that regard. Two weeks had passed and Sergio started hinting to Lucha that they needed to have a serious talk about their future. Lucha did everything she could to delay that moment. She was constantly unsure about how to respond if he were to propose to her. She thought daily about how she would have to accept his proposal because there were no prospects of moving to the city in sight. It was a Saturday. She went out to the yard during the day. In the evening, Sergio suggested they go for a walk, but she hadn't given him an answer yet. She didn't feel like it, and she knew he would start pressing her with questions about their future again. She'd rather sit in the yard with her mother and chat about life. And then Lucha noticed a stranger man behind the fence. He was standing next to their neighbor Victor. They were talking and laughing about something. Lucha approached the fence, leaning her hands on it. Hey, Victor, how's it going? She called out. Oh, hi, Lucha. Everything's fine. And you? Lucha, squinting her eyes, looked at the unfamiliar man who was eyeing her from head to toe. I'm okay, just lazing around today. What about you? Got any plans? I'm planning to show my friend the village. He wants to drive to the river. Drive? Why drive there? You can just walk there. Or were you planning to take him on a bicycle? Lucha asked mockingly. Why on a bicycle? I have my own car, and we're going in my car, the guy replied. Lucha looked at him. A car? Was he from the city or something? He seemed modern. By the way, my name is Pablo. Maybe you'll join us, come to the river with us. Or are you scared? Pablo continued, with a slight grin. Lucha provocatively looked at him. She decided to show him that country girls were fearless. Why should I be afraid? Are you some kind of maniac or planning something sinister? She replied, not losing her composure. 
Pablo raised one eyebrow and folded his arms over his chest, flexing his muscles playfully. Well, why would I plan something sinister? Quite the opposite. I wanted to get to know you better and have a good time together. Or are you already involved with someone else? Lucha opened her mouth to say she was taken, but she hesitated. If she said that now, he might lose interest in her. But if she told him she was available, what should she say to him? She couldn't figure it out on the spot. And if I'm involved, does that bother you? Pablo smirked and once again examined her from head to toe, lingering on her chest and lips. No, that doesn't bother me at all. So, are you coming with us? Lucha decided to take the risk. Who would forbid her? Besides, she wasn't doing anything illegal. After all, she was a free girl, not engaged, and hadn't made any solemn promises. So, she replied, I'll go. Why not? From the moment Lucha got into the car with Pablo, her life changed dramatically. In just one evening, the guy charmed her. While talking to him, she felt a glimpse of the life she had longed for and dreamed about. The city had always attracted her, and a city man seemed like a godsend. She hung on to his every word, and he noticed. Pablo liked how this naive village girl looked at him. He was eight years older than her and had seen a lot, but Lucha's enthusiastic gaze elevated him to the heavens. He had never felt so important and significant, and Lucha's beauty was certainly a significant factor. Only a week had passed, and Lucha had forgotten about everything else in the world. She only thought about Pablo. She enthusiastically shared everything he told her about the city, the latest news, and city life with her mother. Her mother was skeptical of her daughter's excitement and cautioned her. Lucha, be careful. Don't let him fill your head with his words. You might regret it later. Think more about practical matters. Your dreams and aspirations won't lead to anything good. As for Sergio, he was in shock at how his beloved had changed. She constantly rejected him, citing various excuses and refusing to go out with him. When he saw that she had made acquaintances with Pablo, he was furious. But in this case, he couldn't resort to violence since Pablo wasn't a local guy. Moreover, he was older, and there was no telling what a fight with this city slicker might lead to. He appeared bigger and stronger, and even though Sergio wouldn't admit it to himself, he was afraid of him. Then, two weeks after meeting Pablo, Lucha approached her mother and said, Mom, I need to tell you something. You see, in short, Pablo proposed to me, and I said yes. And next week, I'm going to the city with him. Valentina Iglesias was in shock. She began to lament and tried to reason with her daughter. Lucha, are you out of your mind? What are you doing? You've only known this guy for two weeks. Who is he? What does he do? How does he make a living? Do you even know anything about him? He's turned your head with his car rides and beautiful words, but you don't know what he's really like. You barely know him. Maybe he's planning to deceive you. Can you just leave everything behind like this? And Sergio? Goodness, what about Sergio? What will happen to him? Have you thought about it? He's loved you for so long. Don't you realize that this will crush him? He's been pursuing you for years, hoping that you would be together. How can you do this to him? Didn't you allow him to show you attention? What are you doing? Think it over, Lucha. Lucha frowned and replied, Mom, I'm already an adult and I know how I want to live my life. I know enough to trust Pablo completely. He suits me perfectly and I love him. We're getting married and I'm going to live with him in the city. And don't talk to me about Sergio. I didn't force him to chase after me and I didn't make any promises to him. We were just friends and we kissed a couple of times, big deal. Did that mean I was planning to marry him? No. I won't let some village guy ruin my life. Valentina Iglesias cried, shouted, and begged her daughter to think it over carefully, but it was all in vain. Lucha had already made up her mind, and she wasn't going to change her decision. Valentina realized that there was nothing she could do. 
The next day, Lucha told Sergio that she was leaving. When he heard that she was leaving, he was speechless. When will you come back? Are you leaving for a long time? He could barely get the words out. Lucha lowered her gaze and said, I'm leaving forever. I'll be living in the city now. What about us? What about me, Lulu? Lucha frowned and replied sharply, There's no us. I don't know what you've been imagining, but it doesn't concern me anymore. But how can this be? I wanted us to get married. I love you. Well, that's what you wanted. I didn't make any promises to you. You'll have plenty of other girls. And why are you looking at me as if I'm a traitor? I don't like it. And, by the way, I'm getting married soon. When Sergio heard about the marriage, he blushed with anger. Married? Married? You're getting married? To who? To that braggart? Don't call him that. It's none of your business. That's it. I'm done with you. I need to get ready. I'm leaving tonight. Goodbye, Sergio. And Lucha headed home. Sergio watched her go. The city slicker was approaching her. He gave Sergio a mocking look. Sergio took a step toward them but then saw Lucha take the city guy's hand and stopped. Lucha and the guy went to her house while Sergio clenched and unclenched his fists with intense hatred. He also suffered from severe emotional pain that filled his mind, soul, and body. Your fiancé? Pablo mockingly asked Lucha. Oh, that was just for fun. He'll get over it quickly, the girl replied. In the evening, Pablo loaded Lucha's bags into his car. The girl bid farewell to her mother, telling her that she would try to visit but that it would be better if her mom came to see her. Valentina wiped away tears. She couldn't believe that her daughter was leaving like this to start a new life. She didn't understand what was happening. Nothing had foreshadowed these events. Then Lucha got into the car with her fiancé, and they drove away. Throughout the night, many in the village heard frantic screams that sounded like the cries of a wounded animal, but no one went out or raised an alarm. Everyone knew what those sounds were. It was Sergio, trying to cope with his pain. He had lost his beloved, the girl for whom he was willing to die, for whom he would have killed anyone. She had dealt him a fatal blow, and he couldn't do anything about it. All his friends were with him that night, making sure Sergio didn't harm himself. Perhaps if it weren't for his friends, Sergio might have done something foolish, but they were there. And Sergio's mother cried all night and prayed. Only by morning did Sergio finally exhaust himself, and only his mother could calm him down. It was only for the sake of his mother that he held on to his sanity. He promised her that he wouldn't do anything foolish. Lucha had left forever to build her life in the place she had dreamed of, leaving behind the ruins of a broken heart of a boy who loved her more than life itself. Lucha married Pablo. As she had dreamed, she became a true city dweller. They often say that you can take a girl out of the village, but you can't take the village out of the girl. But in Lucha's case, it was different. She underwent a radical transformation, and once couldn't tell that she had spent most of her life in the village. She turned into a fashionable beauty with excellent taste. She quickly adapted to the pace of city life and felt like she belonged there. She adapted to the new circumstances, got rid of her old village habits, and acquired city manners. She even managed to get rid of her rural accent, which was especially challenging for her. But after hours in front of the mirror with her phone, she learned to speak as if she had always been a city girl. Pablo had a good job. After their vacation in the village, he returned to work with renewed energy, and Lucha took care of the house and herself. She gradually transformed into the image of a fashionable lady, and Pablo realized he hadn't made a mistake. He had a wife he could proudly show off in society. She made an effort to please him on every occasion because she was grateful that he had taken her out of the village and given her the life she had always dreamed of. It's been ten years. Lucha didn't work all this time. Pablo earned very well, he satisfied all his wife's whims, although she didn't demand too much. 
They went on vacation several times a year, and at least once a year, they traveled abroad. And all these trips broadened the horizons of the former village girl Lucha, who hadn't been anywhere for the first 18 years. The current Lucha had visited many countries and cities in 10 years. Their wedding anniversary was approaching, and Pablo had prepared a gift for his wife in advance. He bought a trip to a fancy seaside hotel. Yes, they could have gone abroad, but for some reason, this time, he didn't want to go far. Besides, it was a brand new five-star hotel, and he wanted to experience it. The trip cost a lot of money, but it was a significant occasion. Lucha was meticulously preparing for their vacation. She completely updated her wardrobe, underwent a massage course and figure correction procedures, and visited a cosmetologist several times. The day before their departure, she tried on all her new swimsuits, and she showed herself off in each one to her husband. So, how do I look? She said to her husband when she once again emerged from the bedroom in a new swimsuit and matching tunic. Pablo raised an eyebrow and frowned. Lucha, did you buy new swimsuits for everyday wear? Lucha, with a satisfied look, twirled around in front of the mirror, examining herself from all angles. Well, almost. Do you have a problem with that? Pablo chuckled. No, I don't have any problems with it. You look fantastic. All the men around will be envious. You must be aiming for that, my dear. Lucha smiled radiantly and approached her husband. She leaned in and tightly hugged him around the neck. Beloved, you know that you are the only one for me, and I will never look at anyone else. I'm doing all of this just for you, my dear. Oh, Pablo, I love you so much. You're just wonderful. She kissed him on the neck, hugged him even tighter, and closed her eyes. How happy she was that she left the village back then. Her life had turned out just the way she wanted it, and almost all her dreams had come true. She had everything she wanted, and she didn't even need to work. But Pablo didn't want children, and Lucha had asked him about children several times already. Well, he didn't want them now, he would want them later. What's wrong with that? She's still young, she'll have them when the time comes, and they'll both be ready for it. The next day, they set off on their vacation. After checking into the hotel, they headed to the pool, which was located on the premises. There was everything one could wish for. There was a separate area for children, so adults could relax without worrying about their offspring. But there were hardly any children here. Lucha splashed around in the pool for a long time. Pablo said to her, Stop it already, you'll get sunburned. Let's go down the slide instead, look how high it is. Oh no, Pablo, you know I don't really like slides, especially such a tall one. No, no, you won't convince me. I'm sure I will, Pablo replied. Lucha chuckled, challenging him. I won't agree under any circumstances, so you definitely won't persuade me. What if I promise to agree to have a child? Pablo asked with a special cunning tone in his voice. Lucha looked at him skeptically. Was he really telling the truth, not deceiving her? After a minute, she said challengingly, Let's make a bet then. And if I ride it once, we'll have a child. Deal? Pablo smiled and nodded. When Lucha sat on the edge, the instructor gave her some instructions, but she didn't hear them. She just stared down with wide open eyes. Yes, it wasn't easy at all. She had to muster all her willpower to make this move. And then she heard a shout from below. So, it's high, isn't it? Well, okay, start descending. I won't laugh at you if you can't jump. I know it's impossible for you. That's what Pablo yelled to her. He didn't believe she could do it. Well, she would jump. Whatever happens. Pushing off, Lucha rolled down, hearing the instructor's frightened indignation behind her. But then she didn't hear anything except a ringing in her ears. The fall should have lasted only a few seconds. It felt like she lost her balance and was about to fall off the slide, so she clumsily moved immediately, and in that same second, something went wrong. She flew into the water, turned somehow awkwardly. 
when she plunged into the water hit first, she felt sharp pain in the first second. It seemed like a fiery arrow had pierced her entire body, and it would have made her scream in wild pain if she hadn't been underwater. She couldn't resurface. Lucha closed her eyes and groaned. Her entire forehead was covered in beads of sweat. It had been six months since the accident, and there was no progress. She would never forget their 10th wedding anniversary and that fall from the slide. She hit her back on the edge of the slide and landed awkwardly in the water. She suffered a spinal injury. Who could have thought this was possible? Dozens, even hundreds of people had gone down that slide, and the tragedy happened only to her. And such a tragedy that now she couldn't walk. What she had been through in those days was indescribable. She went into hysterics when she woke up. How? She couldn't feel her legs? And for how long? Maybe forever? It couldn't be. Denial and anger consumed her alive. Pablo had to spend a lot of money to get them back home. At home, they began visiting doctors, and all of them shrugged their shoulders. No one knew what to do. They all said that recovery might be possible, but maybe even surgery would be needed. But no one could explain the further plan of action. They simply didn't know what to do. Only one doctor, whom Lucha had seen just yesterday, told her, I think everything can still be fixed. But you need a long rehabilitation, and you should be taken care of by highly qualified specialists with extensive experience in such cases, and it requires a comprehensive approach. You can go through this kind of rehabilitation only at one clinic, and it will be expensive. If you have the money, I'll give you the number and email address to contact the administration of this clinic, and you can arrange everything with them. And Lucha was sure they had enough money. For six months, she had hardly spent anything on herself. Pablo continued to work, and they were financially well off. Moreover, Pablo started working overtime, often coming home late, explaining it by taking on additional work to earn more. Lucha was furious with herself for ending up in this condition, but it wasn't her fault. And when she said that it was Pablo's fault that she went down that slide, he had a fit. Are you out of your mind, you fool? Did I drag you there by the hand? Don't you dare blame me, or you'll regret it. Is it your new habit of shifting responsibility onto someone else? This won't work with me, got it? And from that moment on, everything went awry between them. Pablo started treating her strangely. He hardly ever smiled, the trust was completely gone. He often sat at home in front of his computer or was on the phone, constantly texting someone. Lucha felt lonely. Her husband hired a caregiver and housekeeper who came every day to assist her, or rather, to do all the work for her. Lucha searched the internet for ways to help herself, but there was too much information, and it was all over the place. Without recommendations, she didn't know where to turn. And Pablo was behaving as if everything was fine. Lucha lay there, her eyes closed, and thought about herself. Why did Pablo remain silent after yesterday's doctor consultation? Why didn't he say anything? She expected him to initiate a conversation about her rehabilitation, but he said nothing. So, she would ask him herself today when he returned from work. Lucha wiped the sweat from her forehead and the tears streaming down her cheeks. How bad and lonely she felt. How much she wished her mother could be with her. But Pablo wouldn't allow her to come. He had never allowed her to visit for all ten years of their marriage. Lucha had gone to see her a few times on her own. They hadn't seen each other for the past couple of years, and now she missed her terribly. When Pablo came home from work, once again later than usual, he habitually peeked into his wife's room and greeted her. He was about to leave when Lucha stopped him. Pablo, wait. Could you come in here? I need to talk to you. Pablo grimaced, but then composed himself. He sighed heavily, entered the room, and said, I have a lot of work. Is this urgent? Can't we talk later? Lucha said loudly, Yes, it's urgent. Your work can wait a bit. I need to talk right now. Please, have a seat. Pablo's face showed a visible aversion that he couldn't hide. 
Lucha felt her heart freeze. Her lips trembled. Pablo regained control of himself and said, No, I'll stand. I hope this conversation won't take long. I'm really short on time. Lucha sighed and said, Sit in the chair then, if you don't want to sit next to me. Pablo gave her an attentive look and decided not to argue. I wanted to know what you think about yesterday's doctor consultation. You heard what he said, right? I have a chance to recover. When do you think I could go for rehabilitation? Maybe you could take some time off? I think it's necessary to make it more convenient for both of us, she asked. Pablo stared at her, frowning. After a minute, he finally said, What rehabilitation are you talking about? Did we ever discuss this? I don't recall us talking about anything like that. Lucha felt a chill and an impending sense of disaster. I didn't understand what you mean by we never discussed it. Haven't you heard what the doctor said? I can get better, Pablo. And what? What are you hinting at? Haven't you heard that this is all very expensive? Do you think I'll just sell everything so you can go for treatment? What about our future? Do you want me to lose everything because of you and your illness? Pablo retorted. Lucha felt her heart beating faster. What was he saying? Why was he saying such things? They love each other and should support one another. Pablo, how can you say that? Isn't my recovery the most important thing right now? I don't want to be disabled for the rest of my life. I can't. I won't endure it. Pablo, don't upset me. Pablo jumped to his feet and shouted. Do I have to give up everything so you can walk? I've worked for years to achieve success and financial stability, and now you want me to lose it all in a day? No, that's not going to happen. I don't have that much cash. I won't touch the offshore accounts. I won't sell the apartment or the car either. Don't even hope that I can help you. No, I can't. Lucha cried and shouted. How can you? I'm your wife. You're supposed to help me. What are you saying? Don't you love me? But Pablo didn't respond. He headed for the door, then turned back and said, There's nothing more to discuss. Forget about it. You won't be able to go for treatment anywhere. I'm not going to ruin my life because of you. I never signed up for this. If you're not satisfied with something, then... He didn't finish his sentence, then left and closed the door behind him. Lucha cried all night. She couldn't believe how much her life had changed. Everything was fine. How could everything change so abruptly? What was she supposed to do now? She would remain helpless for the rest of her life, and no one would help her. What a horror. And in the morning, another unpleasant surprise awaited her, something she never expected to hear. Pablo came into her room and said, I've thought it over, and I've made a decision. I don't need your complaints anymore. I won't listen to them anymore. I'm filing for divorce, and I'll take you to your mother's house in the village tomorrow. Besides, I've had another woman for a long time, and she loves me, and I love her. She completely suits me, she doesn't have the kind of demands you do, and she doesn't drain me of my money. But you, you just want me to lose everything, to become destitute. So, it's time for you to move back to your mother's. I'm going to start a new life, you know, I'm still fairly young, and I'm not planning to bury myself. I can't live normally with you. You're such a burden. And what to do with you next? I can't even imagine. Although I can imagine, I need to get rid of you. You won't be able to keep up with me anymore. I've already told your caregiver, she'll come to you today to help you pack, and tomorrow we'll head to the village. Lucha didn't even have a chance to say anything before he left the room. Lucha cried out of pain and hurt. She had long felt that things between them weren't as smooth as she thought, and she realized that he probably hadn't treated her, even before the accident. Maybe he never loved her. Yes, perhaps she appealed to him, but love... Could a person who loves someone do this? Could they abandon them in their most difficult moment? No, a loving person wouldn't do that. 
how right her mother had been when she warned her ten years ago. She had lived all these years in a life she had invented for herself. But what was the reality? She didn't even understand it. Pablo found it convenient to be with her, and that's why he married her. As for Lucha, she just fell in love with him. And she dreamed of city life. But where had this city life led her? Now she would return to her mother in disgrace, and on top of it all, she would be a helpless invalid. The next day, Pablo put his wife in the car, carried her suitcases, and they set off for the village. The journey was long, about five hours, and Lucha worried about how they would manage to stay together in the car all that time. But Pablo didn't speak to her once, he didn't even look in her direction, and she didn't talk to him either. She sat there in silence. The only thing she prayed for was not to need to use the bathroom. Pablo was unlikely to assist her with that. He hadn't done it once in the past six months. The caregiver had been taking care of her all that time. At night, the caregiver put diapers on her. Her husband had never taken her to the bathroom or helped her bathe. He found it all disgusting. They spent the entire five-hour journey in silence. They only stopped once at a gas station. Pablo got out of the car without a word, went to the restroom, and then bought himself coffee. He didn't even offer any to her. What's more, he didn't even ask if she wanted some water. No, he just ignored her. And Lucha? Lucha had resigned herself to the fact that he found it unpleasant to be around her, and she didn't want to further humiliate herself by creating a scene. She just wanted to get there as quickly as possible, hide in her room, and not see anyone else so that no one else could hurt her. When they finally arrived at her mother's house, Lucha's heart was pounding so hard it felt like it wanted to leap out of her chest. She was afraid of meeting her mother. She was afraid of how her mother would react to Pablo's actions. She was afraid her mother would reject her or remind her that she had once warned her about her rash decisions. But none of these fears materialized. Everything turned out quite differently. Near Valentina's house, there was a tractor, and Valentina herself was working in the ground in front of the house. A man was standing nearby, who had been digging the soil earlier. When they saw the car, he stopped working and looked with interest at the foreign car. Lucha recognized this guy. He was Sergio, the guy who had suffered because of his love for her over ten years ago. Lucha sat in the car and stared at him intently. Pablo had already taken a simple wheelchair out of the trunk and rolled it up to the car from the side where Lucha was sitting. Her husband approached her to take her out of the car, but Lucha just sat there without moving. That's when Pablo rudely said to her, Why are you sitting there? Come on, hurry up. I don't have time to spend with you. My God, you're such a fool. Lucha flinched as if slapped. She hoped no one had heard those words, but it was unlikely. Burning with shame, she reached out to him. Pablo took her, placed her in the wheelchair, and wheeled her towards the house. Lucha tried not to look at Sergio, but she felt he was watching her. The girl looked her mother in the eyes. Valentina Iglesias stared at her daughter. It was impossible to tell from her eyes what she was thinking. Pablo rolled her to the doorstep of the house and said mockingly, Look, here's your groom. He's right here as if he sensed his bride was coming. You won't be bored here. Who knows, you might even get married again. This is your place now, my dear. Lucha felt terribly ashamed. There was no hope left that Pablo's words wouldn't be heard. She turned her head and looked at Sergio, but he wasn't looking at her. He was staring intently at Pablo with such hatred and anger in his eyes that Lucha wanted to cry. And then her mother's calm, cold voice broke the silence. Have you said everything you wanted to? Then get out of here, city slicker. Nobody here wants to see you. Go on, or you might run into trouble. Pablo was taken aback. He wanted to respond rudely to Lucha's mother, but then he saw the former fiancé of Lucha approaching them. And it should be noted that now Sergio was bulkier than Pablo. Joking with him right now was quite dangerous, so Pablo silently walked back to his car. He took out Lucha's suitcases and bags from the trunk and placed them right on the ground near the gate. Then he got in his car and drove away, 
leaving a trail of dust behind. The three of them remained silent for several seconds, and then Sergio quietly approached the gate and picked up all of Lucha's bags. He carried them into the house. While Sergio was away, Valentina approached her daughter, tears in her eyes, and gently stroked her head. Lucha took her mother's hand and pressed it against her cheek, closing her eyes. Did you make a big mistake, my daughter? Valentina quietly asked. Very big, mom, very big, Lucha whispered. Valentina let out a deep sigh and replied. I'm glad you've come back. Of course, it hurts me that it took your illness for you to return to me. I would give anything to prevent this from happening. But right now, I'm glad you're with me, and no one here will harm you anymore. And Lucha burst into bitter tears. She couldn't see anything in front of her due to her tears. Her mother whispered something to her and comforted her. After a minute, Lucha felt someone lifting her up. It was Sergio. She pressed herself against his warm neck and cried even louder. He held her tightly and carried her into the house. For about a week, Lucha didn't go out into the yard and didn't interact with anyone. She spent all her time lying in bed while her mother took care of her, helping her and feeding her. Lucha tried to recover from her grief and shame. She also feared coming face to face with Sergio. More than 10 years ago, she had hurt him so badly, and at that time, he seemed worthless and insignificant to her. But now she saw that he had become a real man. Even his gaze was different. It held strength, toughness, courage, and sharp intelligence, and there was no more weakness in it. Sergio's life had toughened him, and now Lucha was so ashamed of her reckless and thoughtless actions ten years ago. She had only thought about the city and hadn't valued what she already had. And now she had nothing. She returned in disgrace, like a beaten dog, crawling back, and she would never recover from this. But after some time, she began to regain her composure. She talked a lot with her mother, sharing her life and asking for forgiveness. For what, Lucha? What are you to blame for? No, daughter, there's nothing for me to forgive you for. Is it because you didn't come to visit me? Well, that's your business. Children should live separately from their parents. You didn't have the opportunity, so you didn't come. I don't blame you for that. All of that is in the past, and there is no point in dwelling on it. Now that you've returned, we need to move forward. Come on, don't be upset, and don't cry. There's nothing here to regret. Everyone has their own destiny, and you shouldn't complain about your. If you have to live like this, then accept it. Live in a way that you won't be ashamed later. But if you keep complaining and crying in this room, I'll scold you. I'll even punish you if necessary, Valentina concluded, a little irritated. Lucha wanted to be offended by her mother's words, but then she realized that her mother was saying all of this for her own good. She laughed for the first time in months. Valentina smiled and gently stroked her daughter's hand. Everything would be fine, she would adjust to her condition. From the next day onwards, Valentina started taking her daughter outside. Lucha was surprised to see that the doorstep next to the steps had been modified. She had heard the sounds of sawing and hammering in the backyard. Her mother said it was Sergio. He had been helping her around the house for several years now, ever since his mother passed away. Now he lives all alone. He still hasn't married. After these words, her mother looked meaningfully at Lucha, who pretended not to understand the hint. Although Lucha understood perfectly well, she realized that Sergio had made the doorstep specifically for her so she could go from the house straight to the yard. Her heart warmed at the thought. She sat in the yard, her hands folded on her knees, when a tractor roared loudly as it approached. It was Sergio. He turned off the engine and stepped out of the tractor, slowly making his way to the house. In his hands, he held a bundle. When he reached Lucha, he placed a bundle on her lap. What's this? She asked without a greeting. It's herbs from the forest. Remember how we used to gather them for my mother when we were kids? She said these herbs calm a person down. I collected them for you, so you won't cry like that anymore. You cried as if someone had died. 
Lucha felt tears welling up in her eyes. She lowered her head and examined the bundle, running her hands over it. Well, welcome back, Lucha, Sergio said softly. She raised her eyes and replied. Thank you. She saw something in his eyes that touched her to the core. There was such tenderness, as if he was looking at something wondrous. She wanted to say so much to Sergio, but she couldn't. Did she even have the right? She had treated Sergio so unfairly, could that ever be forgiven? However, he had forgiven her, and he didn't hold a grudge. Sergio was with her every day, helping in any way he could. They started talking again. At first, it was just small talk, but then it grew into more meaningful conversations. Lucha began to laugh again. She felt more alive and real than when she was living in the city. She realized that all these years she had been pretending to be someone she wasn't, slowly losing herself. And now she had returned to her roots. She also understood that she had never meant much to Pablo. To him, she was just a plaything, an object. He used her, and she allowed it. She had lived without realizing that she was dragging herself down. Eventually, he would have left her anyway, as she grew older, as gray hairs appeared, or the first wrinkles. He would have left her and found a younger wife. Maybe it happened earlier because she fell into misfortune and became disabled. Perhaps everything had happened for the best. Maybe it was meant to be this way. Over time, Lucha and Sergio grew so close that they could talk about anything under the sun. She told him about her life in the city. By this time, she could speak calmly about her past. She told him how Pablo didn't want children and how she now understood why he acted that way. They simply weren't important to him, and they never would be because he was selfish and only cared about himself. She described the accident and how she lived for six months afterward. She talked about Pablo's attitude toward her, how he had told her he had found a mistress. She told him everything. When she finished her story, Sergio said to her, You know, I thought I would die when you left, and I didn't know how to go on living. It felt like my heart had been ripped out. I only held on for the sake of my mother. She had no one else but me. And then, you know, I got used to living with that pain. It never let go of me. The pain kept me in its grip, but I learned to live with it. I learned to ignore it. There was only one side effect, I couldn't love anyone, so I never got married. There were girls who tried to win me over, but they weren't you. Yes, I dated, I was involved with someone, but no one could give me back my heart. And you know who gave it back to me? Lucha swallowed hard. She knew he was about to mention someone's name, and it was going to hurt a lot. She whispered, not wanting to hear his answer. And who was it? Sergio looked intensely into her eyes and said, It was you. Lucha raised her eyebrows and looked at Sergio in amazement. She couldn't believe her ears. What? She whispered, Yes, you, Lucha. When you came back, when your husband brought you back, I physically felt my heart start beating again. Lulu, you gave it back to me. And I don't know what else to say. I... I still love you, Lucha. I love you even more than before. This feeling has been tested over the years, and I can confidently say that my heart will belong to you until the end of my life. Wherever you are, whoever you're with, it will always be with you. Lucha cried as she listened to Sergio. Her heart ached when she thought about how much pain she had caused him. Then he leaned in and kissed her, and she responded to his kiss. From that moment on, her life changed. They became even closer to each other. Sergio spent all his free time with Lucha. He stayed at their house until late at night. And two months later, he told her that he wanted to take her to live with him and asked her to be his wife. Lucha had already received her divorce papers. Pablo had sent them through a courier and didn't want to come in person. But she doubted whether she was ready to disrupt Sergio's life again. Yes, she realized she loved him, and perhaps she had always loved him, but she just hadn't realized it. But could she willingly condemn him to such a life? She was disabled, and he was a healthy man. What could she offer him? She felt inadequate, 
while he was strong and healthy. What use was she to him? However, when she voiced her concerns to him, he simply embraced her and whispered in her ear, You'll see, everything will be fine. I promise you, I'll do everything possible to help you recover. It was a stark contrast between her ex-husband and the man who had loved her all his life. One man had abandoned her as soon as she fell ill and refused to help, even though he had the means. The other vowed to help her get back on her feet, even if he didn't have enough money for it. Lucha moved in with Sergio. Valentina was happy for her daughter. Now they lived across from each other, and her mother was always there for her. Over the years, she had missed her mother so much that she didn't want to be separated from her anymore. And now, she had the love of her life. A few weeks after her move to Sergio's house, he sold his tractor. When he told her about it, she was very surprised. Why? Why did you do this? How will you work now? Sergio just waved it off. It's not a problem. I'll rent one when I need it. It's not that expensive. Don't worry about it. And I sold it for a reason, Lucha. I sold it to pay for your treatment. I want you to go and undergo rehabilitation. I want you to get better. I'll do everything so that you can walk again. I'll do anything, even sell the house if needed. Yes, Sergio was the complete opposite of Pablo. And Lucha realized that at 18, she had made the worst mistake of her life when she left Sergio. This man would never hurt her. She would try to make amends and make him happy. Sergio sent Lucha to the capital. He accompanied her to the train station himself. He paid for her stay at the clinic. She underwent an expensive surgery, and now she faced a long rehabilitation. The doctors explained that she needed to come back in a few months after the surgery for rehabilitation and further treatment. In the meantime, she could return home. They bought a special rigid brace for her to wear when she was in a wheelchair. A couple of months later, they returned to the village. However, this entire trip, staying in the capital, surgeries, and all the medications had cost a fortune, and almost all the money from the tractor sale had gone towards it. They were running out of money, and in a few months, Lucha wouldn't be able to attend the rehabilitation, which was also quite expensive. Lucha was inching closer to recovery, but had hit a roadblock, and there seemed to be no way out. Sergio, however, remained optimistic. He believed that they would make it work and find the money for her treatment. He even considered selling the house. Lucha had already lost faith in a positive outcome, and she told him that if he sold the house, she would never forgive him and would leave him immediately. Sergio had to promise her that he wouldn't do anything like that without her consent. As for Pablo, things weren't going as smoothly as he had hoped. He had been delighted to get rid of Lucha and had planned to marry his lover, Nadi, right after the divorce. Nadi had moved in with him after he got rid of his wife and things had immediately taken a different turn. When Nadi was just his mistress, she had been sweet, affectionate, undemanding, and behaved decently. Pablo had been happy to have found a better replacement for the ailing Lucha. However, everything changed later. As soon as Nadi felt like the owner of his apartment, she had undergone a radical transformation and started demanding too much. It turned out Lucha had been the ideal wife. She had never asked for the impossible or excessively expensive things. She had never asked for gifts and had been content with what he gave and offered. Pablo was a god in her eyes. With Nadi, it was entirely different. She considered herself a goddess and thought that everyone should dance to her tune. She believed Pablo should fulfill all her whims and wishes, and initially, he had done just that. Pablo bought her everything she wanted, hoping that she would eventually calm down. But her desires grew, and she demanded more and more. Most importantly, everything had not gone according to his plan. Pablo had indeed fallen in love with this calculating, greedy girl, and he couldn't defy her. The roles had reversed. He had once used his wife Lucha, and now his lover Nadi was using him. When the divorce was finalized, he proposed to Nadi. However, she didn't give him a direct answer to his proposal. She said it wasn't the right time to get married and suggested delaying it. Pablo didn't know why she was postponing it, 
but he patiently waited for her to respond positively. He continued to spend more and more money on her. His expenses were increasing every month, and he had already emptied his foreign account. He struggled to keep up with his earnings, even taking on additional work. And then Nadi wanted an expensive car as a gift from him, but he no longer had the money. However, as if under a spell, he went to the bank and took out a huge loan in his name. He hoped that after such a gift, Nadi would immediately agree to marry him. Pablo knew he was doing something wrong, but he couldn't act differently with Nadi until she became his wife. He had no right, and Nadi had repeatedly hinted at that. He was waiting for their wedding, and then he would hold her accountable, make her pay for all the stress and exorbitant money he had spent over the years. But everything went awry once again. He had miscalculated once more. Nadi graciously accepted the expensive car as a gift, thanked him sparingly for his generous gesture, but she didn't agree to marry him, saying it wasn't the right time yet. Pablo was furious. When would it be the right time? He couldn't understand what she had in mind and when she would marry him. He began to realize that she was simply stringing him along, feeding him lies. He was drowning in debt, had taken out a substantial loan in his name, and now he had to make significant monthly payments for several years. But how could he do that if she continued to drain him of every last cent? He was desperate. How could he break free from this vicious cycle he had gotten himself into? Marrying Nadi had become a matter of principle now. He couldn't admit that he had made a mistake by getting involved with her. He had never been wrong about women before. He used them as he pleased and then discarded them if he felt like it. It had been that way with all his girlfriends in his youth and with his ex-wife, Lucha. But with Nadi, it was entirely different. He had stepped on his own rake. This calculating woman was using him, and he couldn't do anything about it because he hadn't lost hope of winning over her. And he started thinking that it would be great if she got pregnant. But even there, he faced failure. No matter how hard he tried, nothing worked. One time they talked about children, and Nadi said with a look of disgust, Ew, kids, I hate kids. I've never liked those little monsters. And I've long since decided that I will never give birth myself. If I ever decide to have a child, I'll use a surrogate mother's services. But to carry it myself, no way. Never in my life and I've taken care to ensure that I won't get pregnant. It's never going to happen. And Pablo realized that his last hope died with her words. He wouldn't be able to make her marry him against her will. When he ran out of money completely and started discussing it with Nadi, she simply dumped him. She took all his expensive gifts, all trinkets, the car, and left. She left a short note, stating that it no longer made sense to be with him and that she had gone abroad to her former lover. That was the end of a beautiful story. And Pablo was left with nothing. Although he did have something after Nadi, huge debts and an impressive loan in his name. He barely made ends meet, trying to settle his debts with friends who had lent him money. At home, in the evenings, he seethed with anger, thinking about that bedhopper who had taken advantage of him and cleaned him out. Some time passed after Nadi left him. Pablo was in a terrible mood all the time. He tried to spend all his free time on work to distract himself from negative thoughts. He didn't even look at women. He had used them all his life, and now, faced with someone who had used him, he believed that all women were harpies and vixens, and he couldn't even think about women. And soon, something happened that gave him hope of restoring his reputation and financial well-being. One day, someone knocked on his apartment door. Pablo opened it and saw an unfamiliar man in a business suit holding a shiny briefcase, typically used for documents. When Pablo asked what he wanted, the man replied that he was looking for Pablo's wife. Are you looking for Lucha? You're too late. We're no longer married. We got divorced. And what exactly do you want from her? Did she take a loan and not repay it? Then I'll tell you that I have nothing to do with it. We divorced a long time ago, and she probably had her own shady dealings after me, Pablo said with irritation and malice. However, he didn't expect what the man would say to him. No, it's something entirely different. You see, 
By the way, my name is Rosario. So, you see, Lucha inherited a significant estate, and I'm looking for her on behalf of the estate. We need to process all the documentation so that she can inherit as soon as possible. Pablo was so surprised that his mouth hung open. An inheritance? From where? How could this be? He needed to find out everything right away. His tone changed immediately when he responded to the man. Why didn't you say that you have an important matter related to her? Please, come in. I'll make you some coffee, and we can talk calmly and unhurriedly. Rosario entered, and Pablo feverishly thought about the advantage he could gain from all of this. So, what were you saying about the inheritance? Tell me more. Sugar or milk? Or both? Pablo asked. Rosario smiled politely and replied. With sugar, please. Thank you. You see, she had an aunt, her mother's sister. She probably didn't even know anything about her because Inés Iglesias went abroad when she was very young. She had a big falling out with her parents and sister. They were against her marrying a foreigner. But Inés Iglesias did things her way, and they never communicated again. However, Inés kept an eye on her relatives all her life. She knew about her sister's fate, and she knew about her niece. Ines Iglesias had a very wealthy husband, and she was involved in business her whole life. But they had no children. Ines' husband passed away five years ago, and now she has passed away too. She bequeathed her entire estate to her only niece, Lucha, while she was still alive. However, a few years ago, she stopped keeping track of Lucha's life because she developed Alzheimer's disease, and six months ago, she passed away. And now we need to talk to Lucha. She needs to inherit. We thought Lucha was still your wife, and we hope to find her here. My goodness, what an incredible story. So, my ex-wife is a millionaire now, is she? Pablo asked in amazement, looking at Rosario with wide open eyes. Rosario took a sip of coffee and nodded. Yes, now she's a millionaire, and I'm not talking about dollars, if you add up the value of all the real estate left to her abroad. Pablo was speechless. Silence hung in the air. Pablo's hands trembled as he thought about how this representative might not have come here at all. He could have gone straight to the village if they had continued to monitor Lucha's life. And then all this money would have passed him by. Dollar bills flashed before his eyes, and he had already calculated how he could use them if, if he did everything right, wisely. He needed to come up with something now, take action, not miss this opportunity. Pablo smiled warmly and, leaning forward, patted Rosario on the shoulder. The man looked at him puzzled. You're lucky, Rosario, you came to the right place. I can organize everything in the best possible way. You know, I'm on good terms with her now, and we're friends, despite the fact that we're no longer married. We often call each other, and I even help her sometimes. You know, I'll help you. But I need to ask you something. We need to surprise her. She loves surprises. Leave me your phone number, and I'll organize everything in the best way. I'll go to her as soon as I can and bring her here. Then I'll call you, so you can come. And then we'll tell her such wonderful news together. What do you think? She'll be thrilled. I think that's how we should do it. What do you say? Rosario squinted suspiciously at Pablo. The smile faded from his face as he placed the coffee cup on the table and rested his hands on his diplomat. He had already opened his mouth to say something but quickly changed his mind. He smiled again, not in a friendly way but politely. Pablo had thought the guy would reject his idea, but Rosario said, Yes, that's a fantastic idea. She lives in the village with her mother, right? Excellent. You bring her and then call me right away and we'll handle everything in the best possible way. I'll be waiting for your call. Just so you know, I won't be in the city for a couple of days. I need to go abroad for a while. But I'll be back and I think we can meet in about a week. Pablo was elated. This was even better. He had time to prepare for the meeting with Lucha. 
and this meeting wouldn't be easy, so this time was necessary. He escorted the guy out, then thought about how to proceed. Unfortunately, he couldn't go to the village right away. He could only do so in four days. But he wasn't too worried because the representative of Lucha's aunt was still not in the city. Pablo finished all his work and then headed to the village. He bought a large basket of expensive flowers for his ex-wife. Each flower was in a special vial of water, so there was no need to worry about them wilting or getting damaged during the journey. Look, Sergio, I knitted you these socks. Lucha proudly handed him socks that she had knitted herself. Sergio took them, examined them, and barely held back a laugh. Well, they are very beautiful. I really like them, he replied seriously, looking at them. Lucha looked closely at his face, then frowned. You're laughing at me, I can see that. You're definitely laughing, just not showing it. I don't know what I did wrong this time. Sergio hurried to reassure her. My love, everything's fine, I really like them. It's just that, well, I doubt I'll be able to put them on my feet. Lucha frowned even more and took the socks in her hands. She turned them around, not understanding what Sergio meant. Then she realized and burst into laughter. Oh, I didn't even think about that. My hands are definitely not from the right place, she said, wiping tears from laughing. The socks were indeed beautifully and neatly knitted, but they were so tight that it was impossible to put a foot through them. Sergio laughed and gently patted her cheek. Your hands are in the right place. Something just went wrong this time. Next time, it will be fine. Oh no. I'd better find myself another hobby. I admit, knitting is definitely not my thing. I just tried to prove myself wrong. Nope, didn't work. They laughed again. Valentina watched the couple from her window. They looked so happy. She was delighted to see how Sergio had changed. She felt sorry for this wonderful guy who had pined for Lucha almost his entire conscious life. He had always loved her. When Lucha was 18, Valentina knew her daughter was making a mistake marrying that scoundrel. However, she couldn't order her. Over the years, Valentina had watched Sergio, who had practically grown up before her eyes. She had seen how much he had suffered without Lucha, and she had seen how quickly he had matured, experiencing incredible sorrow from the loss of his crazy love. And when his mother died, Valentina had stepped in for her. She helped him cope with his grief. How good it was that Lucha had returned home. Valentina saw that, despite her disability, Lucha was happier than ever now. There were no more thoughts in her head about city life. She had been terribly mistaken and had suffered, and now noble Sergio was healing her soul, and he was doing it wonderfully. May they be happy, and may everything work out as they had planned. Valentina watched them, smiling. Then her smile dimmed. She saw a car approaching the house, and Valentina immediately recognized Lucha's ex-husband's car. He had brought her home to the village in this car. Valentina turned pale. Well, the moment of truth had come. It was time to say a final goodbye to the past. Sergio and Lucha were strong enough now to do it with dignity. Sergio was telling Lucha something, and she was laughing when both of them heard the sound of an approaching car. Lucha fell silent immediately, and Sergio tightly squeezed her hand and stepped away from her, taking a shovel in his hands. Pablo pulled up to Lucha's house and turned off the engine. He sat there for a few seconds, calming his breathing. After preparing himself and checking his appearance in the mirror, he noted that his expression was appropriate. Well, it was time to start. He got out of the car and approached the gate slowly. He looked at Lucha, sitting in a wheelchair. She was silently looking at him, her face expressionless. Pablo inwardly rejoiced that he didn't see hatred on her face, things weren't as bad as he had feared. This made his task easier. He glanced sideways at Lucha's former suitor, who was completely ignoring Pablo. Even better. All that was left was to finish everything to the end. Hello, Lucha. May I come in? Pablo said politely and amiably. Lucha clenched her fists slightly, but immediately regained her composure. Hello. 
Well, yes, she replied. Pablo smiled slightly and opened the gate. He approached his ex-wife, glancing at the guy with the shovel, who paid no attention to him. What brings you here? Lucha asked politely. Pablo took a seat on a chair next to her and smiled. Well, why am I here? I came to see how you're doing, something like that. Lucha raised an eyebrow. How I'm doing? Are you kidding? Look at me, I'm still in a wheelchair and there's no change in sight. You're the one who brought me here and left me behind. Why did you come now, Pablo? Pablo sighed, pretending to be deeply upset. You see, Lulu, that's precisely why I came. You know, I've been thinking about you for a very long time. I want to confess something to you. You see, I lied to you. I never had a mistress. I've loved only you all these years. I still love you now. Understand, I was scared when the accident happened to you. And I admit I treated you very poorly. I was unfairly rude to you, and I don't deserve forgiveness. I've been tormented for a long time. I wanted to come here and take you back home with me, but, but I caused you so much pain. I thought I didn't deserve you and that you'd be better off without me. But I couldn't. Forgive me. Forgive me, but I couldn't live without you. I thought of you every day. And I was slowly dying without you. I realized that you would always remain in my heart. And I began to wonder what to do. I couldn't decide for a long time to come to you. I wanted to ask for your forgiveness, but I was sure you would kick me out, wouldn't listen. I was afraid to hear curses directed at me. I was afraid you'd hate me. But now, I don't see hatred in your eyes. You didn't chase me away when you saw me. I consider that a good sign. He fell silent. His lips were dry from excitement. In any other situation, he would never allow himself to express his feelings and emotions like this, but right now, it served his purpose. He hoped he looked like someone who was sincerely repentant. That's how it was supposed to be. Lucha remained silent, which encouraged him. He began to elaborate further. At one point, I woke up in the morning and realized I couldn't go on without you. I had to tell you this, and I don't care if you'll kick me out, yell at me, hate me, or hit me. I don't care. I love you very much, and I don't care how you'll react to my visit. I have to say that I love you and have always loved you. Lucha didn't say a word, so Pablo resorted to his trump card. He stood up and quickly walked to the car. Opening the rear door, he retrieved a large basket of flowers. He solemnly brought the basket and placed it at Lucha's feet. Forgive me, my dear, kind, gentle girl. You are the best woman in the world. And I admit my mistake. It was my own foolishness that made me lose you and leave you in trouble because I was afraid of something. But now I promise you that we will do. I will do everything possible to heal you. I'll sell everything I have just to see you recover, and I'll put in all the effort to make it happen as soon as possible. I beg you, just come back to me. I can't live without you. You're my angel, my love, my only woman. Forgive me and come back to me, my dear. And we'll get married again. I'll do everything you want, just come back to me, my dear. Lucha had planned to remain calm for a while longer, but Pablo's performance stunned her. He had never looked as sincere as he did now. And right now, she wasn't sure if he was lying. She would have actually believed him, she would have forgiven him and gone back to him. Oh, what a horrible person he was, and she had given him many years of her life. Lucha wanted to torment him a little more, but she couldn't hold back any longer. So, Lucha, will you forgive me? Pablo gently asked, placing his palm on her hand. He looked into her eyes tenderly, and Lucha carefully removed his hand. Then she said shortly, looking him straight in the eyes. No. Pablo realized that his prey was slipping away, but he began to plead. Lulu, my dear, believe me, I'm sincerely repentant. I need you. I miss you so much. And then Lucha couldn't contain herself and burst into laughter. Pablo looked so ridiculous. 
He stared at her in bewilderment. I can't keep silent anymore, I swear. Pablo, you're hilarious. Pablo stammered, trembling with nervousness. What? What do you mean? Lucha shook her head reproachfully. Pablo, really, no, I don't need the city life anymore. Understand, you opened my eyes when you brought me back home, and I'm immensely grateful to you for that, of course. If you hadn't done that, I would have never known what real happiness is. There it is, happiness, where people love you just because, and where they are willing to give their all just to make me happy. And it's precisely for people like them that I live now. I became happy only when you brought me home. You truly saved me, Pablo. With you by my side, I would have withered away and died, and you would have simply stepped over me and walked on with your head held high. But here, I found myself. I became the person I was meant to be from the start, before I met you. Pablo was dumbfounded. He didn't know what to say, and even if he did, he wouldn't have had a chance to say anything because he wouldn't be allowed to. Get out of here, jerk, he heard a male voice. Pablo turned and looked cautiously at the guy with the shovel, who was now very close to him. Pablo took a step back. Leave and don't ever come back. You don't belong here. And if I ever see you again, I won't hold back. You think we don't know why you're here? We know, believe me. You came here for the inheritance, right? And only because of it, you thought of getting Lucha back. You planned to get it, didn't you? Well, we know everything, and you won't succeed now. It's not your business anymore. She's not your wife anymore, the divorce papers prove that. And Lucha is with me now, and we'll get married soon. So get out of here right now, don't test my patience. Pablo quickly grabbed the basket of flowers and almost ran to his car. When he got onto the street, he threw the basket of flowers aside and got into the car. Within a minute, he had disappeared. Pablo was driving and yelling in anger. If he had known about the difficulties that lay ahead, that he would soon lose everything he had, he wouldn't be yelling, he'd be crying. But he had no idea about it yet. Sergio and Lucha remained silent for a few minutes, and then he asked her, Are you okay? Lucha sighed and replied calmly, You know, everything went even better than I expected. Sergio sighed in relief and sat down next to her. Thank God. I was afraid he would upset you. He still brings back too many unpleasant memories. Lucha smiled and took his hands. She had left all the unpleasant memories behind. They had known about the inheritance long before his arrival. Fortunately, Rosario turned out to be very perceptive and clever. He immediately figured out that Pablo would try to deceive him and decided to find Lucha in the village himself to inform her about the inheritance. He did that the day after talking to Pablo. He went to the village, and since he knew the address, he told everything about Ines Iglesias. Valentina Iglesias cried for a long time when she learned about her sister's death. She deeply regretted that they hadn't communicated for years and that she didn't know that Ines had been watching over them and their lives all those years. She was very saddened that her sister had passed away without ever seeing her family again. In reality, Valentina hadn't held any grudge against her sister for many years and she would have reached out herself, but she didn't know her address, last name, or even the country she lived in. However, her sister knew everything about them. Well, fate can be very unfair at times, and one had to come to terms with it. When Rosario told Lucha about her husband, his suspicious behavior, both she and all her close ones immediately sensed that he was up to no good. And they decided to teach him a lesson. None of them, of course, knew about the financial difficulties Pablo was facing, but that didn't matter. This was no longer their story. Sergio smiled again, looking at his future wife. So, what are our plans now? Lucha smiled radiantly. Plans? HM, I don't even know. Probably, I would like to marry you first, and then we need to deal with the inheritance. And then you and I will go for rehabilitation, and now we will see it through to the end. We'll spend all Auntie's money if necessary. I feel that this time I will come back home on my own two feet. 
I am sure of it 100%. And after that? After that, we'll see. I think we'll find something to do. Right, my dear? Right, my love, right, Sergio replied and placed his hand on Lucha's cheek. Valentina smiled contentedly, watching them from the window. Well, they had passed this test with flying colors, and now she was confident that everything would be fine. These two would move mountains, pursuing what they desired with all their hearts. And Valentina was sure that her daughter would walk again. They just had to wait a little longer, and then... Oh, how I already want grandchildren, God bless. I hope they won't delay with this matter, because I'm not getting any younger, and I want to play with them while I still have the strength. I hope I won't have to wait long. I'll go pray for it, Valentina Iglesias whispered quietly and crossed herself. She glanced at the enamored couple once again, and then she stepped away from the window. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.